The Lord be with you. A reading from the Gospel of John. So Pilate went back into the praetorium and summoned Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you say this on your own, or have others told you about me? Pilate answered, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom does not belong to this world. If my kingdom did belong to this world, my attendants would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not here. So Pilate said to him, Then you are a king? Jesus answered, You say I am a king. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world, to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. The Word of the Lord. Dear brothers and sisters, today is the Feast of Christ the King, and in churches all around the world, we celebrate this feast that Christ is our King, that He is our Lord. We greeted Him today with a, a song that recognizes His kingship. He is the most important for all of us here today. If we had a, a vote of the people in the church, who the most important King is, it would be Jesus. Uh, unless maybe there's someone in the church who's a different religion, we would all agree that Christ is our King. But it's very often the case that when we leave this church, uh, sometimes, for example, when we um, meet a friend, uh, someone who we know. And we ask them, how are you doing? And they respond, oh, don't even ask. Don't even ask. You know, the, the world is difficult. Uh, there are so many problems. Uh, people have difficulties, uh, addictions, pornography. Uh, when you ask your friends, it seems like everything is so difficult. It was like in Poland during the old days when May 1st would come and the communists would have their parade and everyone would come to the parade and smile and act like they enjoyed the parade, and as soon as the parade would pass by, everyone would mutter under their breath, uh, this is so bad, and uh, when will this be over? We all agree that Christ is our King, of course, and when we talk to each other about it, uh, we say, of course, He's a great King, yes, He's a wonderful and mighty King. And then when we leave the church, we look around and we see what's going on in the world. So much injustice. Uh, my dear brothers and sisters, what, what can I say? Uh, there are many people who, for example, are even angry at the, the priests of the church. And, and when they leave the church, uh, it's no longer... Uh, the feeling uh, that Christ is our King. Oh, they say the priests have too much money or they're immoral. Many people have uh, bad feelings towards the church and, and in fact, uh, 
Many people ask the question, how can God let all of these things happen? Uh, how can this be allowed? This is not fair. Why is it like this? Of course we're scared to admit this to our friends. But we shouldn't be afraid to say, Dear Lord, no, have mercy. Well, what's going on? What kind of king are you? What kind of king are you? Of course, if we look at the platform of this king, honor thy father and mother, do not commit adultery, and if we were to really apply this to the world, we would have something like zero point seven percent support in an election. Who would vote for this, that you have to be good to each other, that you can't swear, that you have to be a fair person? In an election today, you can't even talk about these things like uh, to remove uh, filth from the television because uh, the, you can't even speak this. This would not be something that would be very popular or have uh, much support. So the question is, would we really vote for Jesus if we could? Would we really elect him to be the leader of our life? There was a very famous Polish writer, Ignacy, his last name I didn't understand, and he used to, in his writings, say, oh, if I were God, if I were God, I would do it this way. I'm not sure if anyone in the room ever asked or says something like this, what if I was God? What if I could uh, be God and, and, and have effect? What would I do? Uh, if I was God, I would really clean up the show. Uh, the criminals would do a good community service. Uh, the the people who are drinking and not uh, um, following Christ would be in the church saying the rosaries. The prostitutes would be off the streets and would be participating in the community in a more beneficial way. How great would it be? My husband would make a cake for me. I would, I would do so many wonderful things for my country, Poland, for my family, for the world. God doesn't seem to be interested. I once talked recently, not that long ago, with a, with a woman, uh, with a married woman. And I said to her, why are you so stressed out? Why are you so aggravated? And she replied that she was out recently with her husband and they got into a small argument. Uh, he started to show himself how important he was. A little bit too much alcohol. It wasn't that bad. But I saw that something still was bothering her. And she said, She said, I don't like it when my husband drinks. 
because then he becomes a person who says so many compliments about me. He compliments me so much. He tells me that I'm the most beautiful. That on Sunday he would do everything for me. But you know, Father, I wish he would say this to me when he's not drinking. You know, when he's sober. Do you know? You know, God could do all of these things. He could fix the world tomorrow. He could make it perfect. But God doesn't want people to be perfect for the sake of being perfect. He wants people to honestly say and act in a way that invites Him into their life. God, in a way, is like this wife. He doesn't want to hear the compliments when we are drunk. He wants to hear the compliments when we are sober. God likes to see enthusiasm in people. And when we pray in church, it's very monotonous. It's often without enthusiasm. It's often very dull. But God longs for the enthusiasm, for the true uh, love and, uh, and prayer. Christ is the victor. When you look at the world, it's true. You can think that Christ is not able to handle this, that he's unable to function, that he's unable to, uh, to, to be the king. When we look at ourselves, look how weak we are. Uh, oftentimes when people come and speak to me, they uh, say to me, I am so weak, I am so unable to, to be strong. I cannot stand. The problem is that Christ doesn't want to have a big show with lights and flashes. Christ wants to be victorious on a deeper level. If you, if you ever see the victory of Christ, they're very deep in people's lives. I am a witness of many of Christ's victories. And they are amazing, uh, but they are usually on a deeper level. I will tell you a story about the victory of Christ, about a friend of mine who lives right across the bridge here, about one bus stop away. He's a priest friend whose name is Bogdan. And he uh, grew up, as I said, about uh, a couple blocks from here, across the bridge, in the apartment buildings. And he had a friend during his childhood named Vladek. They played together when they were little boys in the sandbox, on the swings. My friend Bogdan became an altar boy after his first Holy Communion. Vladek started to get into trouble. He started, Vladek started to walk around the neighborhood and start to do, do mischief. And eventually he became known as a very frightening 
a kind of criminal in the neighborhood. Uh, people were afraid of him. When Vladek would go into the elevator of the apartment building, people would get off. He became known as a thief in the neighborhood. My friend, as he got older, uh, went to become a priest and eventually became a priest. And so these two childhood friends uh, ended up in very different places. Uh, my friend uh, Bogdan, a priest, and Vladek, um, a troublemaker, a criminal, kind of unfocused person. Uh, well, one day, uh, Vladek's mother came to my friend Bogdan and said to him that Vladek is dying in the hospital. Uh, could you please come to see him? My friend said, of, of course I can go, and he set out to the hospital to see his uh, friend Vladek from the childhood times. When, the, when Bogdan entered into the hospital room, Vladek was very elated, and he said, Oh, Bogdan, you came to see me. Oh, that's so great. Uh, welcome into the room. Please sit. I have to show you something, but when the nurse leaves, my friend uh, Bogdan thought he would pull out either a bottle of alcohol or maybe a gun to show how these doctors are really not uh, knowledgeable. And what did he pull out? But it was a prayer book. It was a prayer book, and my friend Bogdan was actually quite surprised. A prayer book from his childhood days. You know what, Bogdan? He said, my mother brought me this book with all of these prayers in it. Do you know how interesting this is? And then Vladek asked Bogdan if he would hear his confession. Of course, uh, Bogdan agreed and um, uh, left after a little while. And a few days later, he learned that his friend Vladek had died in the hospital. This is a very interesting story uh, because we would probably think, and I'm not trying to put words into people's mouth, this guy was a troublemaker. He had a heart of stone. Uh, just it, it would be better to cut off his hands. There's no, no need to be sad about his loss. And people like this, just give them a, a bullet or send them to jail forever. But you see, Jesus is always planning with his angels how to save the souls of people so that they can enter into everlasting life with him. He wants everyone's heart, whether it's Vladek or Kshishek or anybody, any name. Jesus doesn't want to lose anyone. So he asked the question, Jesus asked the question, how can I get to this person's heart? How can I get to this person's heart? A girlfriend tries to attract a boyfriend by getting uh, his vision, uh, showing how beautiful she can be. Uh, a father tries to impress his child by buying the child a new electronic device, like a cell phone. Or a new computer or a laptop. And the child say, Daddy, Daddy, you're so great, you're the best. 
But the heart is somewhere far away, and the laptop gets older, and the laptop eventually gets put on the side and not used. And Jesus is not interested in these things. Jesus is interested in how can I get the people's hearts. We are somewhat frightened of God. We, we don't understand how this matches to our view of the world. Where was Christ the King when there was a big mining disaster in Halemba? Where was he then when those miners died? People were praying, lighting candles. No one was able to pray for the survival of these people. This did not happen. These people perished. If he was really a king, he would do something. Something about this king and his kingdom just doesn't make sense. My dear brothers and sisters, I have no idea about what the significance or the purpose of this tragedy was. I saw what you saw. I saw the paralyzing pain on the faces of the families of the miners. We can think about how much they were suffering. But has anyone here thought about what kind of effect this tragedy could have? What kind of effect this tragedy could have on the son of a miner who is far from God? Someone who is going to maybe divorce his wife? Or, or some, some daughter of a miner who said to God, if you let my father survive, I will not have the abortion, I will have the baby. Or maybe uh, in six months after this tragedy, there would have been an even bigger tragedy where more miners would be lost. Maybe God uh, sent this as a warning to prevent future tragedy. Maybe 500 miners would be lost. And now the mines are being carefully watched and maybe these types of disasters will actually happen less. It's hard to say, it's impossible to really understand the purpose of these, these disasters. We don't really even know why it happened, if it was the miner's fault, or if there was a defect in the machinery. Or maybe even one other explanation, and this was probably a minor, but I'm not sure. It was two or three years ago when one of the reporters was having a conversation with uh, the workers, with the miners, and one of the miners said to the journalist, and I saw this with my own eyes, it doesn't matter to me if the left rules my country, or the right rules my country, or if even the devil himself rules my country. Let there just be money. Let there just be money. And maybe the devil heard that prayer. We only see a small fragment of the whole tragedy, even on the news, uh, one millimeter at a time. But 
related to it are thousands of, of millimeters, thousands of, of, of details, which we don't know. And that's why we, we try to make sense of it all. What is the point? And we cannot know what was happening in the hearts of the, the tens or hundreds or thousands of people who have been affected by this catastrophe. But we know one thing as Christians, we believe that no one who has died and gone to heaven wants to return. That's what uh, Jesus said, uh, or, or what Jesus said to the women who were crying that he met along the way of the cross. Don't cry for me. Cry for yourselves. Don't, don't cry for me. Cry for yourselves. Remember that even the souls in purgatory don't want to come back to earth. Because they know from purgatory there is one way out, and that is to heaven, to eternal joy. But on earth there are two ways out. One to heaven, but the other to hell. The people in purgatory are on the road to heaven, even though they will get there later than they wanted to, they are on the road to heaven. And none of them want to come back, and none of them want to come back to earth, and it's, it's very interesting. This is explained to us by many church mystics over the centuries. Sister Emmanuel from Medjugorje said this, and many others. But we think that a good ruler is a ruler who is just. And the idea of just means equal, that everyone is the same. Uh, but if Christ was just, simply just, everything would be the same. Everything would be equal. And thank God that we don't have everything the same. I remember that uh, when I was uh, a younger man, uh, I had several years, I was several years old. When the physics teacher in high school explained to us about electricity. He, he surprised me very much because he uh, had a very anti-communist uh, view. Hmm. So this teacher explained how that uh, energy is what makes things happen. Uh, that what makes the TV work or that makes the washing machine turn. How awful would it be if we were all exactly the same and we all had exactly the same things? How happy I am on Sunday to look out at the congregation and see that not everyone is the same, that we are different. Because what would I have to do? And I really need you. 
How many times I ask for help? Every time I ask for help, you are there. And how much we need each other, a simple example of doctor. We need to have doctor. We priests need to have sisters. Sisters need to have priests. Uh, priests need to have congregation. This is how the world is. I look across, I see this boy or this man is, is, is more successful than me. It drives me to want to be successful. How can I get there? I'm sorry for this kind of example, but uh, when you go to a, a parish where there's a priest, and he's there for the first time, everyone in the congregation is very attentive because everything that priest says is new and hasn't been heard before by the people in that church. And I had an opportunity recently to speak at a church that I don't usually uh, speak at. And after the, the Holy Mass was over, a, a woman came and said to me, uh, Excuse me, Father, but your homily was wonderful if every homily was like this. If all the priests could have homilies like you, then the world would be, the Mass would be better. But I responded and I said, it would be very boring if we all were exactly the same. Uh, the, the issue is genius. If all of the priests could write poems like Father John Twardowski, or if all of the priests could be so spiritual like Pope John Paul II, the world would be unbelievable. But you see, in truth, it's good that we are different from each other. It's good that you are different from each other. Because we would not need anybody if we were all the same. You see, now I have need. I need to have a friend. I need to have a doctor. I need to have a teacher in my life. We need to share each other's talents. We would rot from our egoism or from our pride. We uh, ruin the plans of God. But God always uh, thinks up and sends us a life preserver. And when we do something stupid or something sinful, you can imagine Jesus sitting in heaven at the table with the angels and sending a message to the, talking with the angels and saying, what are we going to now do with this guy? What are we going to now do with this girl? And sending the angel to help this person. How can we help you now, human, to get out of this big pickle, this jam, this difficult situation that you thought up yourself because you didn't ask first if it was a good idea? Maybe some of you have tried to play billiards. Maybe you've been on vacation and tried to play. If you don't have experience with this game, even though there are balls and a cue stick, it's very difficult to actually make connection with more than one at a time. 
jak dwie patrz, uderzyłem i one dwie wpadły, no mistrzostwo świata, państwo widzicie nieraz w telewizji, czy już największy w PC to uderzą tak jedną kulką, że cztery wpadły. But you know, on TV, when you watch people play billiards, the experts can hit one ball, which could actually hit two or three others, and they can all go into the pockets together. And God is this kind of billiards player. We are like beginners that have very difficult time just hitting one ball among all the others. But God is the kind of billiards player that in two or three attempts can knock down all the balls. He can knock down six. The devil will shake his table. But God can do it anyway. And he'll do it. This is a different type of math or geometry. Uh, this is the wisdom of God. Uh, when I was a young seminarian, uh, something happened that gave me uh, reason to think deeply. There was a committee to organize a procession for the Feast of Corpus Christi, the one in Warsaw. There is an altar by uh, the military. And some, some people from the committee came to talk about how this procession should look. And we were talking and I just said, uh, I hope it will not rain because the weather looks pretty bad. And one of the older uh, people on the committee looked at me and said, uh, young priest, do not worry, God is old and wise and he will take care of the day. So from that day, when everything goes wrong, when you planned out everything with every detail, but yet everything goes wrong, so when those things don't go the way you want them to, just remember that the king is not the typical king, the king, the one and only king, wants it to happen differently. Be because we would try to save our plans, uh, even desperately, so that they wouldn't change. Just like that author Zhebski said, what if I was God, how can I control the situation? For example, if you knew that there was going to be an accident, that some kind of driver, truck driver or car driver, driving from, from Poznan to Katowice, And, and, that, and that this driver was going to have an accident and that people would die, what, what would you do? Of course you'd want to uh, prevent this, you'd want to uh, not allow the driver to have the accident. So maybe you would send him an illness, maybe a virus, but he might get better in time to still drive that day. Maybe the car would break. Maybe you would make it so his car would break so that he can't drive. But he might fix the car and be able to go still on this journey that is doomed. So what would you do? Would you cut off his hands? What, what would you do? Or if this would actually be about your father? 
or your son. What kind of idea do you have to stop this? Because God looks at all of us as his children. These are not some strangers to God. These are as if they are his children. These are his children. So maybe uh, he will lose his hand, or maybe he will lose his eye, or maybe something will happen to him so that he does not have this horrible accident where other people die too. God looks at you just like you look at your beloved son or daughter. The wave of God shows how difficult he is because we keep thinking we're smart. We're smarter, that we can do it on our own. We sit around and we know better. We, we sit around, for example, and we come up with all kinds of reforms for the church because we know better. I don't know if you've ever seen this movie Blues Przek Magonce, but in this movie there was somebody who never liked anything. So God came to him and said, okay, so from tomorrow you're God. And rule the world. So the first thing this guy did was uh, make a date with a very beautiful woman. And what he did was he went out on the balcony with this woman and he pulled the moon closer to the earth to give it to her, to make her feel very happy. And then he went back out on the balcony and brought the moon even closer to the earth to make this woman so happy and joyful. She walked out on the balcony and said, Wow, what kind of beautiful moon is this? And it was a beautiful night, they had a great day. And the next morning he turns on the television and he sees that all over the world there was a horrible flood, that uh, ocean waves were high and there were tsunamis everywhere and massive death and injury. Then he heard voices of people praying to him saying how much they'd like to win the lottery. So he said, okay, if these people want to win the lottery, let them win the lottery. But because all those people won the lottery, instead of uh, the payout being a million dollars, the payout was only three dollars. So then the people went and burned their tickets. And so you can probably figure out how this movie went, so that by the end of it, the main character said, Dear Lord, take this away from me. I don't want this kind of power or responsibility. We would be exactly the same. Exactly. I'm saying this to you so that you don't just praise God with songs, only with words. Not only saying Christ the King, but that we would stop trying to be smarter than God. Because God says to us, even in the first commandment, you will not have other gods before me. Trust in me. Stop trying to save the world. God is much older than you and knows what he's doing. We have the question, if God is king, then why do we have wars? Why do we have illness? 
Dlaczego obozy koncentracyjne? Why did we have concentration camps? Dlaczego obozy koncentracyjne? Ursula Wińska. Ursula Wińska. Wyśmiarka obozu kobiecego w Ravensbrück. A survivor of one of the concentration camps. Że przyjaźń była dla uwięzionych najpewniejszą obroną człowieczeństwa. She said that uh, the friendship among the prisoners was the strongest and most memorable part of this time in her life. In the camp, you couldn't pretend to be a moral. You couldn't. You couldn't uh, imitate or pretend to be moral. You just had to be moral. And she said that what was very unique about the camp experience was that you never really thought about yourself. You thought about all of your other prisoners, your your fellow prisoners. She said that all the inmates tried to do was help each other and Never did she really feel the love of people for each other like she did in this camp, uh, Ravinji. When I look back, she says, on her five years in this concentration camp, our biggest strength was our solidarity with each other and helping each other. Our uh, religious perspective, our desire to uh, to remember God. And of course, uh, the friendship between us and the hope that we will return to a free Poland. The, the name of her book is um, uh, Victory of the Values, something like this. And she talks about how in this book, uh, this was five years of her life, of a very moral and clean life in the camp. She met very beautiful people. I don't really understand this mystery, but I uh, kneel down before Jesus and say, I trust you because it's not possible for me to really understand this. Radomsprig and Auschwitz makes no sense. It's a secret. A secret, a secret of God. Uh, it reminds me when Stalin asked the Pope how many legions or divisions does he have. And we often ask, where is our strength? Where is the strength of the church? So let us today accept God and praise Him for how beautiful He is. We often come to our God with our problems. And we don't even see him. Often we kneel before Jesus and adore him. Look at me, Jesus. Look at my problems. My family's messed up. But there's no adoration there of Jesus. It's adoration of my problems, of myself. Let us not make this mistake to adore ourselves instead of adoring Jesus and trusting Him. It's worth today on the Feast of Christ the King looking at how beautiful Jesus was. 
a king for the ages. A beautiful king, when they came to arrest him in the garden, and he was with his apostles, he said to those who would arrest him, Leave these alone, you have come for me. He defended his apostles even in the last moments. I always think about when this happens, when the demons try to come and make us low and tempt us. Jesus says, take me and leave, leave him or leave her alone. Jesus is our king. He will know what to do with these demons and with these temptations. I keep trying to find a, a painter who will paint Jesus of the Apocalypse. Jesus on a horse. With a, with a sword. And behind him, a, a large army. Christ the Savior, Christ the Beautiful. He wants to save us, especially us the sinners. And we have just one big problem with this Jesus on the cross. When we see Jesus on the cross, we feel that evil has won, that evil has been victorious. Maybe we see the person who's hurting us, maybe the person in our family who's causing us stress or lying to us. This is Jesus on the cross because, because it looks like he lost. There's a story about the very famous French painter Renoir, a time when he was very sick. He would still, though in much pain, get up every day and paint, uh, uh, paint paintings. And he was suffering very much. And his friends, when they saw him in his pajamas, so sick looking and so much in pain. And they said to him, why are you painting? Why, why aren't you resting? But what he said, which is very memorable, is Czerpienie przemija, suffering will end, but the beautiful will stay. Suffering will end, but the beautiful will stay. Jesus is our king and he uses this method. The pain and the suffering will pass and the beautiful will stay. Do you know why you're suffering? Do you know why the, the king is inviting you to his kingdom? Because the suffering will end. The tears will dry and the beautiful will stay. We will be able to enter the beautiful that our king earned for us at Golgotha. The tears will be dry. The blood will be dry. And the beautiful will stay. The holy sacrifice of the Mass that you came to this, that you are here today, even though the forces of evil are trying to keep you from here or distract you, 
pracować, to jednak jest to zwycięstwo Chrystusa. I za to Bogu tą uroczystość. This is the victory of Christ, and for this we should be thankful. Dziękujmy. Właśnie tak jak Państwu zaproponowałem, nie mądrząc się i nie próbując detronizować Chrystusa Króla. Like I said, let's not try to be smarter than Christ. Let us trust our victorious King. Let us accept His rule, His His rule, His kingdom. Let us accept redemption from our King. Amen. Well, that may not have been the best translation, but I hope you have an idea of the wisdom uh, that we've been given through this beautiful homily. May God bless you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.